It's hard to pursue you anytime, any place, anywhere. Grace will find you there. In that place you go to know. to you. It's as hard to pursue you anytime, any place, anywhere. Grace will find you Welcome to the weekend here at Somerville Baptist. The pastor is presently preaching through the book of Matthew on Sunday mornings in a series entitled The King and His Kingdom. And our life groups are presently going through the book of Ephesians on Sundays at 9 a.m. in our series called Be Rich in Christ. Help us invite others to be a part of these studies by sharing the graphics on social media. It's a great way to invite your friends to visit with you. Also, today there are several important meetings to make note of. There will be a junior camp meeting following the morning service in the Kids Zone area for all parents that are interested in junior camp. There will also be a brief life group leadership meeting at 4.30 in East Hall 1. 
and a children's Sunday school teachers meeting at five. It will also meet in East Hall 1. The First Impression volunteers will also meet at 5 p.m. in the Gray Room, and the Missionary Pals meeting is at 5.15 in the Family Life Center kitchen. And finally, following the evening service, there is a very important meeting regarding the Spain mission trip in October for any that are interested in going. Mark February 12th and begin inviting friends, co-workers, and neighbors to our special Hope Sunday service at 10 a.m. and then that evening at 6 p.m. will be our annual vision night as pastor shares his heart and vision for 2017. Also, if you're our guest or have recently joined Somerville Family, please plan to join Pastor Lewis for a four-week class called Starting Points to find out more information. The class will be each Sunday at 9 a.m. in Pastor's office during the month of March. Sign up today in the lobby or call the church office. In February of 2018, we invite you to join Pastor Lewis on a life-changing trip to Israel. Please stop by the Welcome Center today to pick up more information and begin planning now. Men, don't miss our new format at our Men's Bible Study Prayer Breakfast. Our new study entitled Getting to Know will instruct us on breaking stubborn habits in our life. Men's Bible Study will be at 6 a.m. every Tuesday at Libby's in Madison and every Thursday at Libby's in Priceville. Also, Divorce Care Class is happening now every Wednesday at East Campus Cafe at 6.30 and it's for anyone who has been touched in any way by divorce. And on Wednesdays in April, Pastor Josh will be teaching a personal evangelism class called Take It Personal. The book and kit are $15 and you can sign up at the bulletin board in the lobby. This class will give us instruction and application on how to effectively share the gospel with those that God puts in our lives on a daily basis. Plan to join us on one of the two mission trips offered this year. On July 8th through the 15th, we will be traveling to Houston to help a new church plant. And then in October, we will take a group to Spain to help several young churches. Call the church office for more information. Also, there is a special single adult Valentine dinner scheduled for Tuesday, February 14th. Please sign up in the lobby at the bulletin board. And today and the first Sunday of every month is Hands and Feet Collection Sunday. Please see your life group leader about what you can bring or bring the basic can or box goods and leave them on the table as you enter the Family Life Center. Take advantage of our Valentine edition of Parents Night Out on this Friday, February 10th from 6 to 9 p.m. You can sign up at the bulletin board and the cost is just $2 per child to cover their pizza and drink. Let's worship now. Psalms 96.9 instructs us to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness.
choir. What a great truth. Justified, satisfied. Let's stand. We're going to sing a song we learned back in October. Across the land to the word of God the Father. Let's sing this together. If you will be seated just a second, and we're going to have the worship team to sing through this tonight. All my days, I will sing this song of gladness.
around and welcome each other. We'll come back and sing just one more song after we have a time of welcome tonight. This third verse together. I long to be where the grace is never ending. Yearn to dwell where the glory never fades. Where countless worshipers will share one song and Christ of worthy will I. up tonight for kids time all the young people up through fifth grade and if you're a guest tonight we'd like to invite you to come as well our young people will be doing verses at the end but if you're not prepared to do that that is no problem at all we still have a gift for you and brother cody is going to come and lead our kids time tonight all right hey everybody i've got a little something that i want to show you here in my pocket who can tell me just what this is callie Right, a badge, and it has my name, and it has what I studied in college, and also it says what? West Coast Baptist College at the top, right? So what I want to use this for represents a label. Does anybody know what a label is? It's something that identifies you, right? It's something that shows who you are, maybe something about you. And so this shows what my name is, what I studied, and even where I went to school. So with that, I can be labeled as a West Coast Baptist College student, and I can be labeled as somebody who studied pastoral theology. But I've got somebody else who's going to help me just by sake of illustration to help us understand labels. So if my buddy Jackson will come, and he is going to help with this as well. Hurry, buddy. We've got to go fast here. Now, Jackson, as you can tell, is dressed very sharp, isn't he? And so maybe in which a way we could label Jackson as, as just somebody who either 
really loves going to church, is all about business, or really just likes to dress up. And we can label him that way. We can label him as somebody who has some really nice shoes, or label him as somebody who likes to use a lot of hair gel, right? But the problem with labels sometimes is they don't always do us justice because sometimes those labels that people can give us uh, can be hurtful. Or sometimes those labels don't even really define who we are. And some, a lot of the times, those labels are only a part of who we are. But you see, I don't want you to focus on those things because the labels that the world around us gives us is not who we are. And it's not about what we're about. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, the Bible says that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, because the world around us, boys and girls, can give us so many different labels uh, just by uh, the things that we say, the things we do, the things we wear, maybe certain colors that we like, or all kinds of different things. But the only label that you and I need to be concerned about is about knowing that the world around us knows that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the one that defines us. And he is the one who determines all that we are to be and all that we are to ever do. So when you get focused on different things, don't be worried about those labels that people give you. Just be worried about what Jesus Christ thinks of you. Don't forget that he is the one living inside you, and he is the one that you want the world to see. All right, who's got some verses tonight? Luke 1, 27, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. First Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Psalm 37, 5, Great is our Lord, and of great power is understanding is infinite. Numbers thirty two twenty three, and be sure your sin will find you out. Romans ten nine, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that he hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Ephesians four thirty two, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Proverbs six six, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. John one one three three. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything that made that was made. Luke one forty seven. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Romans 10.13. For whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3, 16. And so who, for God so loved the world that he gave his only forgotten, begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have an everlasting life. For Let's give these young people a hand as they head back to their seats tonight. Let's stand together, sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandered. 
Matthew chapter 2 tonight. And Christian's going to come and be singing for us right before Pastor comes. to suffer all alone. You came for all mankind to bridge the great divide. Somehow ended up alone. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never Spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all the pain and buried all the shame when you made that rugged tree. It's like to walk these roads. My problems don't compare to that crown you had to wear. Still, you take them as your own. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know. Your spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all the pain and buried all the shame. You made that rugged tree a righteous throne. Rugged tree, a righteous throne. Lord, because of you, I'll never walk alone. Because of you, I'll never walk How many of you uh, <clears throat> work for an airheaded boss? If you work, uh, Dean Matthews, put your hand down. <clears throat> well, she'll be correcting that. Um, tonight with the music, that was not Josh's fault. That's a pastor who on the schedule is supposed to come up and have welcome time. But for whatever reason, he got caught in dreamland and never showed up. <clears throat> So Josh was on his own there for a while. That was all my fault there at the beginning. I apologize publicly to Josh for that. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 2. Man, I've just been rejoicing. I had the privilege of preaching in a church up in Huntsville this afternoon. It's just a blessing to be able to um, tell people what God's doing in your church. 
how God's working through his people. And I have to tell you, it's a privilege to be a pastor of this place. I mean, it's, and I thank you. I thank you on a uh, Super Bowl Sunday night that a crowd like this is here. That's a great blessing. Because I almost skipped. <laughs> no, I didn't. Yes, I did. All right. Matthew chapter 2. Let's begin reading again at verse 13. This is a profitable passage. And that, that kind of did play on words there. You have three great prophecies coming to fruition. I hope, I, I was trying my best. Man, I was in so much prayer this morning um, leading up Friday when I'd finished up the message. Lord, help me to make it clear. The Jewish audience knew, knows very clearly uh, the importance, the impact, the potency of Christ being the Passover lamb. To we as Gentiles, that may sometimes not carry as much emphasis, but for our salvation it is incredibly important. So I pray that it was clear enough to you. The, the, the great impact of that is that Jesus Christ went to unbelievable lengths to be our sacrifice. And that's the truth you come away from. Tonight there's a couple of other prophecies in this passage. I'll skip. We already went through verse 16. Let's begin reading now at uh, verse 16. We'll start. This is a familiar verse from last week. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, Uh, He wasn't publicly mocked, but men that are power hungry are often paranoid. He was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And on all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. We know this story from last week, the slaughtering of all the babies two years of age and under. And then verse 17, you find the key phrase showing up for the second time now in this passage. Then was fulfilled. Here comes the prophecy now that was fulfilled. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy. We know him as Jeremiah. Jeremy the prophet saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation, grieving, and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. In light of that, take your Bibles and turn back to Jeremiah chapter 31, please. This is what he's quoting from, Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to be in here for just a few minutes in Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, I believe, is one of the great chapters in all the Old Testament. You'll see this by the end of the passage. In Jeremiah 31, he's quoting directly from verse 15. He's speaking back in verse 10. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattereth Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. In other words, he's going to be sending them into captivity, but he'll gather them back again. For the Lord, verse 11, hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the high design and shall flow together in the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy and will comfort them and make them rejoice from their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness. And my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. Then he comes to verse 15. Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. It's almost a direct quote that you find showing up in the book of Matthew. Now what was the point? The point, and I mentioned a lot of this last week, Rachel was the second wife. Remember I mentioned this, of Jacob, he worked for 14 years, seven years to get the older sister, which he didn't want to have, so he worked seven more years to get the younger sister. Finally, he married Rachel. Rachel was his, she was the love of his life. Rachel could not bear children initially. Um, Leah had several sons, and then showed up Joseph. And then after that showed up Benjamin. However, Benjamin was the death of Rachel. She died during the childbirth process. But Rachel was also always known to be the loved of Jacob himself, who later on was named Israel. As a result of this, it's referring to Rachel weeping for her children, this kind of tragic figure in Jewish history of Rachel. But the reason that she's weeping now is something different. Remember when we come to prophecy, what's the principle of prophecy? You have a near future 
and you have a distant future. The near, near future shows up with the term Ramah. Ramah was about seven miles north of the city of Jerusalem. When the Babylonians came into and ransacked and tore apart and destroyed, annihilated uh, Israel and Judah in particular, they took Ramah as the staging point. They would bring all the young. You remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young men in the fire? This is where their jumping off point was. This was the port that they hauled them off from. They gathered them in Ramah, and from Ramah they took them off 700 plus miles over to Babylon. So the women would come, the mothers that would have the family split apart, their children being taken off into captivity, most of them never being seen again, never even heard of again. That was the place of Ramah. So you had this great weeping, you had this tremendous mourning. Well, that's what he's speaking of now. He's referring to the weeping and the mourning. The, the children, the, the parents of those in Bethlehem, they would, they would have known this verse very well. They'd grown up with this verse. The one uh, going through, Cody was talking about going to Bible school and in the years of seminary, I will tell you this, even growing up in it, that was the one thing they never taught you. There's so many things you did not learn in class. One of those things was how many hurting people there really are. Tonight, I look around the congregation, you see things in people's present, you see things in people's past. There's just, uh, there's just a weight sometimes that comes with life. It's not that the Lord doesn't forgive, and it's not that you cannot get past your past. It's just the cares of this world. There comes a point in time to where, Lord, if you take me home, it would be all right. It would be fine. Hurting. Here's the beauty of this. It's not quoted in Matthew chapter 2, but this is not where the passage ends. It's very important to remember that there's more to this prophecy in Jeremiah 31. And that's really what I want to emphasize. And I'm only going to sit on this for about five, seven more minutes. Look at verse 16, if you will. The weeping, the lamentation, the mourning of verse 15. But I want you to notice that's not where God's grace leaves us. Verse 16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. What is he saying? He's saying that the story, my friend, has not yet been told. The grieving is not where it ends. The hopelessness is not your story. For those of us in here tonight that are hurting, for those of us in here tonight who are going through trials that nobody will ever understand, this is not the end of your story. His grace will not allow for that. I know it's dark. And I know that the time, the nights go by very slow now. The day is even worse because now it's facing it, having to go and stand in front of people and act like everything's okay and carry on as if there is no weight but the weight of your shoulders. It's almost unbearable until finally you can get back to the place of the night to where you don't have to put on the fake smiles and you don't have to work through and make sure that nobody can see through the pain, though those who are close to you can see it. And then you collapse into bed and you sleep, but you never really rest. It's not going to be like that from now on. God bling, brings us to a place of restoration. There is a pra- place of hope. How do we know this? Because as you go through this passage of Scripture, God brings us to this final culmination of saying, look, It's no longer going to be about you trying to please me. It's no longer going to be about this perpetual sacrifice. It's no longer going to be about the weight of the law sitting on your shoulders of you wondering if you're ever going to fully please God. By the way, can I tell you something? That is not, this is something I've struggled with for so many years in my own Christian walk, is this constant weight of guilt. This constant, okay, there's one more thing that I have to take care of. There's one more checklist marker that I have to, to make sure that I, that I scratch the box off of. And then God's going to be pleased with me. Then I'm going to be in right standing with God. I'm not saying that we ought to let known sin come in our life. But I will tell you, for me, for quite a few years, it wasn't just known sin. When I, when I dealt with the sin, then it came to the place of saying, Lord, I know that there's something else. I, I, I was never, I was never satisfied I was never, that's not even the word, I was never at peace with God. 
Look down at verse 31 of Jeremiah chapter 31. I want you to see now what he says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. I love this. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin every time they do sacrifice. No, I'll remember their sin no more. I'm telling you, those are precious verses. I struggle so hard with every day really having to come back to those verses for me. I am, I'm saved. Understand, I stand righteous before God. Laura Patterson, when God looks at her, because of Jesus Christ, he sees her as righteous. He sees her as clean. He sees her as accepted. He sees her as beloved. That's the reason he says to you and me. Not because of the sins that we struggle with, that we come back and ask forgiveness for, for sake of clear fellowship. But he tells us, when you come to me, you come into my presence, you come because of Jesus Christ, the, the veil has been torn in twain from top to bottom. It wasn't worn out. It was purposely torn by Jesus Christ. You and I now, I love how the scripture says that we can enter with boldness and confidence into the throne room of God. Most of us have still not learned that, have we? We still crawl in. We still kind of timidly Lord, Lord, it's me. Lord, Lord, I'm here. I, I know you don't want to talk to me, but, but I'm here. And that really is our attitude toward him. Can I tell you what the Lord's response to this is? The Lord's response is, what are you talking about? What do you mean I don't want to talk to you? Can you not grasp this? I sent my son to die for you so that I could talk with you. I went to the ends of the earth so that I could have fellowship with you. I could have started all this over again. I could have put creation into, into absolute annihilation and then started back all over again and created a, a whole other universe. But no, I wanted to have a relationship with you and because of my son and him paying the price, don't you dare minimize what my son has done on the cross by your timidity, by your guilt, by your overriding despondency of I'm not really sure whether the Lord, I'm not sure if he wants to get to know me or not. No, he, lo- he wants, he died to get to know you. We stand, we stand, Paul says in Romans, not by our works, not by our good deeds, not by keeping our account in the clear, we stand by the grace of God. How I wish I could grasp that more. How I wish we as the people of Somerville Baptist, we could grasp this more because it's man's Man keeps scrambling to go back and make it about something that is not. I'm not saying that we ought to continue in sin that grace may abound. And God does not give us grace so that sin will abound. God gives us grace so that we can walk in righteousness. But I will tell you, if sin abounds, grace will still much more abound. You will never reach the depths of his grace. Because of his grace, we don't have to try. Because of his grace, we shouldn't want to try. But because of his grace, even if we try, we never could get there. It is that available. It's that infinite. It's, that, it's in that much quantity. You stand by the grace of God. You're his child. That should not bring pride. It should bring humility. But I will tell you this. It should bring confidence in a believer's life. 
We're walking through our life kind of scratching around. We sing victory in Jesus. That ought to be the anthem of our life. Oh, I just, I just want to walk in victory. I just, I just want to, oh, I just, I just want to be at peace. I just, I, I just want to, I just want to have fulfillment. I, I, I just want to, I want to, I want to have that confidence that I read about in the scripture. I'm not trying to minimize this. And believe you me, I struggle with it. But we accept that by faith. I can be confident because I believe what Jesus Christ has said about me. We can keep believing the flesh. We can keep trying to live in the old man. But we are a new creature in Christ. That old person that was before is gone. It's passed away. Everything has become new. Whether you believe it or not. I heard Mark Lowry say this years ago. You know, I'd have had a lot more fun in life. When we get to heaven, we'd had a lot more fun in life if we would have just realized we were going to make it. You think about how you and I live our life. Oh, Lord, this bill. Lord, this job. Lord, this relationship. Lord, how am I going to get through all these things? Lord, how am I going to? And so we're constantly looking with this fear and this doubt. But God has already put it on the line that he's going to give you the grace that's needed. He's going to give you the strength that's sufficient. He said that to the Hebrew children when they were in the wilderness about their shoes. He said, thy feet shall be, Deuteronomy 33, 25, thy feet shall be as iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. The same is true for you and me now. He says, I've given you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, we can either walk in the lack of confidence of the flesh and keep telling ourselves who we used to be. Or we can finally say, Lord, I am a child of the King. Lord, I stand before you beloved. I'm going to live my life. When I mess up, I'm going to ask forgiveness. I'm going to keep the account short, yes. But then I'm going to go forward knowing that you've not held that against me. Knowing that you're not keeping this over my head. You've forgiven and now we move on and I remember there's sins no more. That's what the covenant of the prophecy of Rama tells us. And then there's a third prophecy. Go back to Matthew chapter 2. And this profitable passage brings up a third and final prophecy. This is probably the most um, vague of the prophecies. Verse 19, but when Herod was dead, behold, another angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel. For they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Herod's passed away now. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, that was the successor of Herod, Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. In other words, he wasn't going to go live in Bethlehem. He wasn't going to go live around Jerusalem because of Archelaus. Archelaus historically, let me tell you who Archelaus was. You would have thought that he would have learned from his father Herod. Right before Herod and died, there were two rabbis, uh, Judas and Matthias. And Judas and Matthias tried to kind of start a revolt there in Jerusalem. And it wasn't a full-blown revolt. It was just one that was kind of subversive. And the slaughter of the innocents had something to do with that. And Herod had them killed, and they were very popular rabbis. As a result, the people started to kind of kick up some dust. While Archelaus was coming on the throne, he wanted to establish the fact that he was um, um, as tough as his dad had ever been. So immediately he had 3,000 Jews of the highest rank in all of Jerusalem slaughtered. Josephus says that blood ran through the streets from the slaughter of Archelaus. So when Joseph and Mary came back, this is what they faced, and they didn't want not have to face the terror. Any Jew within shooting distance of Archelaus was in danger. So in turn, the Lord said, I want you to go up to Nazareth. Continues on here. Notwithstanding the middle of verse 22, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Not just the parts of Galilee, but a certain part. In verse 23, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. 
if you're wondering, if you're a Bible student at all, if you're looking for where in the Old Testament it was saying that Christ was going to be coming from the city of Nazareth, you're not going to find it. It's not there. The point that Matthew is making here is not a point specifically geographically. It's a point that he is making basically demographically. What do I mean by this? In Isaiah 53, take your Bibles and turn there. It begins, who hath believed our report. This is the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the great one in Isaiah. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now it speaks of Christ in this way, verses 2 and 3. Isaiah 53 and verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. It goes on to say, Surely he hath borne our griefs and cared our sorrows. By his wounds we are healed. By stripes we are healed. But it's very key in verses 2 and 3. Now, let me explain this to you, and maybe I, I'm try, I, was try, I was trying to figure out how to paint this picture. For those of us who are... are um, by our lineage from the south, we might grasp some of this. Have you ever noticed that Southerners, I noticed uh, um, my family was a lot this way, that we can, make, we can make fun of ourselves. Now, if you're from the north, let me give you some insight here for just a second. All right? We as Southerners can make fun of ourselves. I can get up here and I can talk with a Southern accent and not many people will get mad at me. There's a reason for that because I'm from the south. I am who I am. I'm a redneck by root. But we don't care too much for when those Yankees come in here and start mimicking us. Because now you're not really mimicking us, you're mocking us. And we don't really care for that. We kind of still. Even to this day, the younger generation is not so much, but the old, we still kind of have a little bit of a chip on our shoulder. You know, you can call it civil war if you want to. You can kind of get closer to calling it a war between the states, but, you know, let's face the facts. It's really more of a war of northern aggression. <laughs> like I said. Why is that? You know what's amazing is that if you go back and study history books, there's a great argument to be made that though in movies and all much is made to do of it, there probably wasn't near the southern accent that we think that there was. Antebellum South was not nearly as southern as we tend to think in our kind of uh, way that we talk and speak. The language was much more just like the northern people spoke. It's when we came out of the Civil War, that all of a sudden our culture became much more important to us because of the attitudes of the now, now, now north to the south. The Reconstruction, this is purely free, this is just my, this is just my historical interpretation, I think had Lincoln lived Reconstruction would have been very different for the South. When Lincoln was assassinated, there came into power those who, much like you find post-World War I in Europe, the same attitude was in the North, that we we're going to make them pay for what they did. And quite frankly, you and I would probably be much the same way. As a result of that, there was this attitude of condescension. There was this attitude, you know, we even referred to them as carpetbaggers coming in. There was a lot of justifiably, unjustifiably, I'm not getting into that argument so much, but there was a lot of inequity that took place during that period of time. So there became this, this chip on the shoulder, this paranoia, because whether it was completely true or not, or to the extent the North had a very condescending view of the South post-Civil War. Now, why am I saying all this? Because we were rednecks to them, uncouth, uneducated, undeveloped. Can anything good come out of 
Alabama. You still find that a lot. The Southern culture is much maligned and it's kind of become a stereotype in Hollywood movies, things of that nature. Well, now you're starting to see. That was the importance, though from the United States it would be the north to the south. In Israel, the metropolitan center was Jerusalem. Galilee was at the far north end. It was the attitude of the south to the north. He's from, Gal- he's, from, he's from Galilee? Let's go a little further with this. He wasn't just from Galilee. Let me tell you something. The Galileans were looked at as rednecks from those in the southern part of Israel. The Galileans looked down their noses at those from Nazareth. They thought that Nazareth was the end of the world. They were the scum of the earth. Can I show you how true that is? Take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 1. I want you to see this. John chapter 1, and watch, even one that was about to become one of the 12 apostles, listen to how he says this, just being very transparent and out front with it. John chapter 1, look down at verse 43. You've had Simon, Peter, you've had Andrew starting to follow Christ, you've had James and John starting to follow Christ, then watch verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip. Remember Philip? He's the one who led the Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. He said unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. Now get this, these are all Galileans. These guys are the rednecks of Israel. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael was so excited. Are you serious? You found the Messiah. The Messiah is finally here, the one that's been written about. Is that Nathanael's response? No, watch his response. And Nathanael said unto him, verse 46, Can there anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? How in the world did the Messiah end up coming from Nazareth? Ever, we always know if you're not from here. It's not Eva, it's Ever. When I first moved here, we had Velma's Diner down at the corner. Miss Velma works at Libby's restaurant. Now, I learned quickly, her name is not Velma, it's Velmer. You better say it right. Can anything come out of Nazareth? Are you serious? Nazareth? The king of the Jews is going to come from Nazareth? Can I give you another proof of this? Take your Bibles and turn over to Acts chapter 5. Or Acts chapter 24, excuse me. Acts 24. I want you to see how this shows up again. This is so ingrained in the Jewish mind that even in a court of law, they're denigrating Nazareth. Acts chapter 24, Paul's standing before Felix making a defense of his Christianity. Starting with verse 1, it says, And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator, literally he was a lawyer is what he is, named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Seeing that we enjoy great quietness, and the very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. What did he just say? I don't know, a bunch of baloney. Verse 4. Notwithstanding, that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man, he's speaking to the Apostle Paul, a pestilent fellow. In other words, this guy is bugging us to death. And a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. Look now, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Ooh, sect of the Nazarenes. By the way, when he said that, his point was very derisive. He was kind of making, he's, yeah, he's the sect of the, the Nazarenes. It was just a euphemism that was used back then of low lowlifes, of anything from Nazareth has to be nasty. What's the point of this? I'll tell you what the point is being made here. The point is that he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
He was despised and we esteemed him not. I want you to understand about Christ. Christ made a point that he was not coming to save kings. Christ was not coming to save the rich. He was not coming to save the educated. He was not coming to save the uneducated. He was not coming to save the poor. He was coming to save all. So he came from a stone manger in Bethlehem. He was born in a stall. He fled to Egypt to come back to show that he was the Passover lamb. And now he is known as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. That nasty town. How could anything good come out of Nazareth? Because whatever God touches turns to the gold of grace. You want to talk about a Midas touch? Then you look at anything that God's grace touches. And he's saying the same thing to you guys. Don't tell him. Aaron, don't tell him what he cannot do with your life. Ronnie, don't tell him what he's not able to do with your life. Greg, don't tell him where you've been and what you've done of what God will not do, how God cannot use you. Don't tell him that. Because God's hand can reach down in his grace. And if he can take five loaves and two fishes, if he can take dust and create man, then he can take the mud and the dust and the dirt of our life and take beauty from ashes. That's the prophecy that's being fulfilled in every life of grace present. A young soldier during the time of Oliver Cromwell in history, he was the revolutionary who tried to overthrow the monarchy in England. He almost got it done, but Cromwell kind of stepped, he just stepped over too far. He was a Puritan by philosophy and belief, and he just expected everybody else that they were going to turn into Puritans as well. It got so bad that they welcomed the king back. That's how bad Cromwell ended up ruling. Cromwell ruled with this iron hand. There was a young soldier who had been tried in a military court under Cromwell's rule, and he was sentenced to death, and he was to be shot at the ringing of the curfew bell that night. His fiancée, she climbed up into the bell tower there in London several hours before curfew time and tied herself to the bell's huge clapper. Now you're talking about something that's probably eight to ten times the size of this woman. At curfew time, when only muted sounds came out of the bell tower, Cromwell demanded to know why the bell was not ringing. The soldiers went to investigate and found the young woman cut and bleeding from being knocked back and forth against the great bell. They brought her down and Cromwell was so impressed with her willingness to suffer on behalf of someone that she loved that he let the soldier go back to his fiancée free, saying, curfew shall not ring tonight. Why did Jesus Christ go to the cross? Why did Jesus Christ fulfill these prophecies in Matthew chapter 2? Why did he become our substitute? It's because he hung on that cross so that you and I, in sin's condemnation, would not have to. That, my friends, is a profitable passage. Let's stand together. Tonight, let's rejoice in the plan of God that's been put in place for our redemption. And by the way, can I say this to you before we leave tonight? It wasn't just his plan to save you. It's his plan to save your neighbor. It was his plan to save your aunt. It was his plan to save your classmate. It was his plan to save your friend. We must tell them that our Savior took their punishment on the cross. And for those of us who struggle with this issue of grace, could I encourage you tonight? Is grace there so that we can keep on sinning? No. But let me tell you why grace also is not there. Grace is not there so that you and I can continue to live this weight of guilt still sitting upon us. Accept the freedom that you have in Jesus Christ. Live free. This passage tells us so. Father, I pray you do your work in our life. Lord, as we come to the time of invitation, reflection, I pray that tonight that we recognize 
that this is your plan. This was your story. And Lord, may we rejoice in this God of grace. Let's sing this hymn tonight. If you need to do business with God, you find a place of prayer. If you want to speak with someone, I'll meet you down in front. But let's sing this together. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. At the impulse of Thy love, take my feet. Father, tonight we lift up this offering to you. I pray that you take it, that you use it for your honor and glory. Lord, that we can reach people with the gospel of Christ to share with them the message of grace, of salvation in you. Lord, thank you that you've fulfilled every prophecy. And Lord, in our lives you'll fulfill every promise that you've ever given to us in your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You can be seated. Let's stand, let's be closed in a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask Larry Winton. Larry, would you come up, close us in prayer tonight, and let's thank God for the people that have been saved over the past few days here, the families that have joined, the Pedros, the Higdons, and pray as we walk out of here that we'll live in God's grace and that we'll share that grace with the people around us. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the time that we've had to come back into your house tonight. We thank you for the word that was given without excuse and without apology, Lord, that it is your word that is, moves through us as we go through the week to draw us closer to you and to be a light to the world around us. Lord, I do praise you so much for what has happened to this, this week of 24 people that were saved and many more that were ministered to and watered and sown. Lord, I ask for you to continue that work in them and those that are working with them that give them wisdom and grace as they do so. Lord, as we get in that grace that we talk about, Lord, let us never get over that gift. So often we take that for granted as just nothing, but it is everything that you that we could ever, ever need is there with you. You've given it to us. Lord, let us never lose that at all. 
Lord, be with us as we go through our week. Let us be a light for you wherever we are and for whatever we do. In the precious name of your son we pray. Amen.